<laughs> Birthdays and anniversaries. Judy, got a birthday. Oh, it's an anniversary. Ronnie Porter Benz. Anybody else with a birthday or an anniversary? What a good looking bunch. Brother and Sister Day. What did you say? 50, 56? 61. Amen. Brother and Sister Day got 61. Who is it? Linda Ellington has a birthday? Does Linda have a birthday? Anybody else? What a good looking bunch here, I'm telling you. <laughs> what a good day. All right, anybody else with a birthday? Think about it now. Or an anniversary. All right, let's sing the birthday song to these youngins and then anniversary. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Only one that not do. Born again. Carl and Dorothy, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Good to see all of you. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, if you've never been here before, would you just slip your hand up? Our ushers have a visitor's card and a gift bag to give to you. Look around. If you just hold your hands up, we have some here in the front here, about the fourth row. we got some in the back. Any others? Got another couple over here. If you could get those hands up one more time, let, let our fellas uh, see ya. If you'll sign, If you'll fill those visitor's cards out, and uh, in just a few moments, we will have the, the ushers coming by. If you'll put the visitor's card in that. Uh, we would love to, to get to know you. Uh, today we have a meal prepared in the cafeteria. If you're visiting, uh, you eat for free. We'd love for you to stay. And so if you're visiting, please stay with us. Uh, we'd love to, love to have all of you here. I um, want, want to make uh, one announcement. Yesterday we had our, our golf tournament. Some of the most beautiful weather you've ever seen. It rained the entire time. And it was about 57 degrees. So all those that played, half of them have pneumonia this morning. They're not here. But I want to show y'all, show the picture. This is Christy handing out drinks. That's how cold it was. And the rain was coming in sideways. But we had one winner, or one foursome that won. And we've got their trophies up here. So Ron, if you can get those trophies for them, we're going to call them up. And believe it or not, they're from the campground. Can you believe that? So we're going to call up Dan Chapman, come forward, and Bill Robbins, Delma Ratliff, and Luther Young. You guys come forward. Let's give them a hand. These are our, our foursome winners. We've got their trophies. They have been nicknamed the Geritol Four. It works. Let's give them another hand. Appreciate all those that came out and worked and uh, those who prepared the meal, Debbie and Charlie and Brian set the whole thing up. We appreciate each of you coming out 
and uh, we, had a, we had a good time. Let's get a songbook and stand. Good to have Dr. Pinson here this morning. He's going to speak to us, and uh, let's get a songbook stand, and, and Ron's going to lead us in a number this morning. Page 167, Joy Unspeakable and Full of Glory. Good to see you. Good to have my old buddy Bob Wilbur and his son John all the way from Missouri. Heard he's going to get a free dinner and came all the way from Missouri. Just right? My buddy, man, we worked together for years. We love him. Appreciate them. Love you and appreciate you. Are you ready to sing? Yeah, how many? That was Christy, I think. All right, page 167, sing with us, Joy Unspeakable. All right. Let's hear it now. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and burn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. Sing it. It is joy. to come. We'll come for this morning's tithes and offerings. Singing on the voice first about joy on speakable. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet I am free, yes, free indeed. And it is joy tithes and offering. Let's remember uh, Jamie Parrish in prayer. Got to spend some time with him last night. I'm telling you, he's in a bad way. Uh, he is in a lot of pain and uh, they don't. he doesn't seem to be getting better. And uh, so he asked specifically, would you please ask the church uh, to pray for me? Also, Ann Twist got to see her. She, uh, she has pneumonia in her lungs and she's hoping they thought she might be having a heart attack. It was actually pneumonia and she should go home maybe sometime today. But let's remember Ann as well in prayer this morning. Brother Tom, would you pray for us?
Amen. Sheila to sing, the anchor holds, so we're going to have her come up, and she's going to sing for us. You give her a hand as she comes to sing. I'm glad the anchor does hold, because uh, Kevin called me this morning and said, you're going to sing this. I said, well, I haven't sang it in a couple years, so I'll get it out and practice it. Couldn't find the CD, then we found the CD, we got a new car, we couldn't figure out how to work the CD player. So now I have the words, and they're tiny, so y'all pray for me, but I'm so thankful the anchor does hold, and I was thinking this morning about this song, how much I love it, and how much I wish I'd written down throughout the years. I tell you young people, keep a journal, and write down every prayer that the Lord has answered for you, because we do get older, and we do forget. I know he's answered so many, but I know I forget sometimes how, how many blessings he's poured on me, and how many prayers he's really, truly answered, small prayers, little prayers and big prayers, and I don't want to forget them. So um, pray for me as I sing this. I do love it, and I love the Lord.
thankful the anchor holds this morning, no matter what you're going through, the anchor Jesus Christ holds. It's so good to have Dr. Pinson with us this morning. He's president of Welch College, and uh, he was a good friend. He's a great friend now. Uh, we, we, uh, we have a great relationship, and I, I was thinking as, as she was singing, he couldn't be with us this time last year uh, because his wife uh, has cancer and was going through a very serious surgery, and uh, she's still, still going through it. She's had a really rough uh, last few months, and I know it's very trying on him and his schedule, and I thought, what if every one of us would promise today Amen. that we're going to get on our knees and lift up Melinda Pinson in prayer? Amen. Every single day until God answers that prayer. Would you do that? Would you promise that today? That we'll lift her up and encourage her and encourage him because he's an encouragement to me that that he can do the work that God's called him to do. But I want you to remember her in prayer especially, Melinda Pinson in prayer. But I love this man. I love uh, all that he stands for and what he's done. I want you to make welcome Dr. Pinson as he preaches for us this morning. What a joy it is to be at Sefner. It's always a boost to me to come here and to see the joy of the Lord in all of your faces. And let me tell you, your pastor, you are so blessed to have a pastor and wife like you have. Your pastor has been such a blessing to me as a friend and as an encourager, but also to Welch College as a trustee board member. We're so glad to have him there. And let me tell you uh, how appreciative we are of this church and the students that you send to Welch College. They are a blessing to us. I just saw one of the young men uh, recently, and I said, I'm going down to Sefner, and he said, I wish I could go down there with you, but he said, I like it up here too. And so we love your students that you send to us. They are a real blessing to us, and we appreciate so much the prayers that you put up for Welch College and the uh, funds that you give to our institution. You know we're moving. After all of these years, almost 75 years on our West End Avenue campus, we are moving to Gallatin, Tennessee, to a new 66-acre campus that we have bought. And uh, the architect of this move is in this congregation. His name is Dr. Tom Malone. And... uh, Way back in, in more than 20 years ago now, the Lord put in his heart a vision that we needed to move out of the area that we were in there in Midtown Nashville, where the zoning is so hard and the property is so expensive that we could not continue to expand our campus and our ministry. And so the Lord laid it on his heart to find a new place for us and to relocate the college so that we could expand and so that we could grow and so that we could do what God has called us to do. And finally, we, after all these years, the Lord, in His timing, has brought us a buyer and we have sold the campus and we are now building uh, our new campus and we want you to uh, pray for us and to support us in every way you know how as we build that new campus for the glory of God and continue our mission that the Lord has given us for, set, for nearly 75 years to educate leaders to serve Christ, His church, and His world through biblical thought and life. It is wonderful to see students come into a place where they can discover what God's will is for their lives. We really believe that every student, every individual, everyone in this room has a unique kingdom purpose, something God has for you. And we believe that every student that comes into our school is there to discover that kingdom purpose. And we are there to equip them to fulfill that kingdom purpose and to give them the tools that they need to fulfill that kingdom purpose. And without churches like Sefner Free Will Baptist Church, like the Tampa Free Will Baptist Church, we cannot do what God has called us to do. You are a part of our mission, not only in sending us young people, but in supporting us with your prayers and your, with your financial giving. And we appreciate it so much and ask you to continue. I also appreciate all of the prayers that you have sent up for my wife. And I ask that, thanks so much, Brother Will, for mentioning her. And I ask that you continue to pray for her in the coming days. Our text for this morning is Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 27. Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. And one of the most illustrious examples 
of the faith of which the author of Hebrews speaks is Moses. And we're going to look at him and his faith in Hebrews 11, 24 through 27. Now this is the word of the Lord. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Let us pray. Our God, we are not worthy to approach your throne. But you have told us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace because of your son, the high priest, who has paid for our sins. So we have nothing to be ashamed of, not on our own merit, not what we bring to the table, but what God's son, Jesus Christ, has done for us. And so we come to your throne even now, and we pray that you will bless us. We pray that your spirit will anoint this preached word that it will help all of us to come into contact with the truth of God which can change us and which alone can change us. We pray that you would work in our hearts to bring about spiritual transformation this morning as we look into this text. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Now imagine what it must have been like. Here was a Hebrew man who'd grown up in the court of the Egyptian pharaoh the adopted son of a princess who was the daughter of the most powerful monarch of the ancient world. But this young man, Moses, he knew who he was. He was secure in his identity. Beneath all the status and the wealth, he knew who he really was. He was a Hebrew. He was a son of Abraham. He was one of God's people. And he knew that God was calling him. He knew that God was calling him to leave behind the power and the prestige and the pleasure of this great palace court and the Egyptian empire. He knew that God was leading him to be numbered among the people of God, the poor, the lowly, the the despised, slaves of the Egyptians. That was his calling. He knew that was his identity. And what does it take for a man to leave behind a throne that could possibly be his one day. The throne of the most powerful nation on the earth. What does it take for someone to refuse to be a prince? To choose to be counted among the poorest, the lowliest, most despised people, a nomadic tribe of escaped slaves, all because he thinks God is calling him. What does it take? Well, the author of Hebrews tells us what it takes. And in this text, he recounts for us the faith of Moses. And he wants us to listen. God wants each and every one of you this morning to listen to him as he speaks through his word. And what he wants us to do is to hear about this faith. Because this faith, Moses' faith, gets to the essence of what it means to be a Christian. It gets to the essence of what the gospel is all about and what our lives in that gospel ought to be about even today in our very complex culture. It's still about the same things. It's about faith. By faith, and that's that phrase that's used over and over again in this chapter, by faith, by faith. That's what it took for Moses to do what he did. By faith. Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now this text has so much to teach us about what it means to have faith and what it means to follow God wherever he leads. And that's what, following, that's what faith is really all about. It's about discipleship. It's about followership, following God where he leads. That's what it's about. It's not just saying what you believe. It's not just mental assent intellectual assent to the truth. It's following. It's discipleship. And I think this text has so much to tell us about what that discipleship looks like. And this morning I want us to focus our attention on Moses' example of faith in following the Lord. And I want each one of you to search your hearts 
and to probe your minds, to ask yourself the question, what does it mean for me to forsake all to follow God? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for you? Well, the first thing it means is that we must embrace the faith of Moses. If we are going to be the people of God for this generation, we must embrace the faith of Moses. At the root of everything Moses did for God was his faith. And this faith that Moses had is the same kind of faith we've got to have today. The same kind of faith Jesus calls us to in the gospel. We see it in verses 26 and 27. Verses 26 and 27 which say that he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. And then down in 27 it says he endured the wrath of the king as seeing him who is invisible. That's what faith really is. That's the content of Moses' faith. That he looked toward his heavenly reward and he saw God who is invisible. Those are the two things that we see about Moses' faith. That's the content of his faith. Those two acts describe the essence of faith. First, looking toward his heavenly reward, having respect unto the recompense of reward, and second, seeing the invisible God. This is the same kind of faith the author of Hebrews describes in the first two chapters of this book. Remember, you can quote it with me. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the definition of faith, right? Well, that's what it's described here in verses 26 and 27. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's exactly what Moses' faith was like. His faith was the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 26 says he had respect unto the recompense of reward. In other words, he was peering into that future reward. He was setting his gaze on the reward ahead that was to come. That's the things hoped for in verse 1. But then verse 27 says that he saw him who was invisible. That's the evidence of things not seen. That's the faith Moses had. And that's the faith faith that every one of you and I are called to. Think about this a little bit. We see here in Moses, in this little passage and in Moses' life, a portrait of saving faith. We see a repentance. He turns his back on the court on Egypt, on what, was before, what could have been his. That's what we do, isn't it? In repentance, we turn our backs on sin. We forsake sin just as Moses forsook the pleasures of sin for a season, refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So we see repentance. But we also hear, see here a belief in an unseen reality. God and his kingdom, an unseen reality. We are so tempted today by what we can see. The lust of the eyes, what we can, what's tangible, what we can place our hands on, what we can put into a test tube, things that can be discovered by our senses. And yet, God says it is the unseen realities that are, that are the most important. But we also see here an investment of our life yes, sir. in that unseen reality. And we're called to that. We're called to pour our lives into the unseen reality of God. Rather than investing our lives in this present, this passing evil age, which is passing away with its lusts. We also see here a longing for deliverance. He's longing, he's peering into the future. He's looking longingly for the reward that will be his after this life. He is not focused on the here and now. He has a desire for deliverance from the the wrath of God, from the troubles of this world, and eternal life with God in heaven. We also see a discipleship commitment to the Lord. He's not just giving God lip service and staying in his comfort zone while saying he loves God. He's not just making a shallow decision based on emotions. A shallow emotional decision will never result in the kind of commitment we see in Moses. What we're talking about here is a willingness to deny ourselves. 
to take up our cross and to follow Jesus. We see all these things in Moses' faith. And that's what faith is all about, the faith that saves us. But you know, brothers and sisters, the faith that saves us is the faith that keeps us. It's the faith God uses to lead us by His own hand day by day. It's the faith that sustains us in the good times. And praise God, it's the faith that that, that sustains us when we think we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And I can tell you this last year has sometimes seemed unbearable to me, but holding to God's unchanging hand has meant so much to me and Melinda. As we have seen what real faith is all about. The faith that saves is the faith that keeps. It's the faith that sustains us. When we in our own strength don't feel as though we can go on. The faith that saves is the faith that sustains. It's the faith that keeps. And the faith that gave Moses the courage to refuse the delights of the world in Egypt later gave him the courage to suffer. To suffer with the people of God in the wilderness. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is calling you. He's begging you even now. He's calling you to embrace this radical faith of Moses. Don't be satisfied with mere intellectual assent to the truth. Don't be satisfied just with religious feelings. Don't be satisfied with past decisions. Don't be satisfied to remain in your spiritual comfort zone and give lip service to God. Embrace the faith of Moses. Embrace the gospel of the Messiah who sacrificed himself on the cross for your redemption and who offers you life that you cannot imagine in abundance and forever and ever and ever. Embrace this faith. I call you to do that today. But if we're going to embrace the faith of Moses, we're going to have to be decisive in the choices we make. That's my second point for you this morning. Be decisive in the choices you make. That's what we see here in this text. Everyone in this room, whether you're 8 or 80, all of you have decisive choices breathing down your necks right now. This is the most important time in your life. While it is called today, you have choices to make. You have a choice to make today. And these are choices that will determine the course of your destiny. And the scriptures are teaching us here to be decisive in making those choices. You see, Moses was decisive. He was not half-hearted in the choices he made to leave the king's court with its power and its prestige and pleasure. He was decisive. He nailed it down. And this text says he refused. This is a strong word in the Hebrew text. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The church father Chrysostom was right when he said, and that Moses did not simply leave these things, he expressed by saying, He refused. He refused. That is, he hated. He turned away. (laughs) For when heaven was set before him, it was foolish to admire an Egyptian palace. And how we are, we have heaven set before us and we are attracted by the dregs of this world. He refuses to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He makes a decisive choice. Refuse here means to deny. It's a strong word to completely turn your back on something. That's what he did. And when we think about the choices that he made to trade the power of the Egyptian court for the powerlessness of one of the lowest nomadic tribes in the ancient world, to choose between the prestige and status of the palace and the reproach and lowliness of God's people, the comfort and ease of a princely life and the pain and suffering of the people of God in the wilderness, the wealth of the king and the poverty of slaves. Just about every area of our lives that we can think of, Moses had a decisive choice to make to follow God and what he was going to leave behind. Our first reaction to this, though, is to distance ourselves from it. Isn't that what we always do with the Bible, Brother Will? We distance ourselves from it. 
It is an ancient text. What does it have to do with my life in the 21st century? And there are some of us in this room right now, no doubt, that are right now saying, well, now that's not me. I'm not rich. I'm not in a Pharaoh's court. I'm not a princely person. I'm not in the ancient world. And we're doing everything we can, subconsciously or consciously, to distance ourselves from this text. Don't do it. Just think about it. The temptations that Moses had and the decision that he had to make is just like what we're going through. Some of you are tempted, no doubt, with power and influence and worldly ambition, just as Moses was. Some of you, no doubt, are tempted with status and popularity in in whatever sphere you're in. And by the way, you know, our culture places a crazy amount of emphasis on status and celebrity. It's tempting to us. And by the way, if you are tempted by status and popularity and celebrity it's going to be very hard for you to withstand the, the, the reproach that the world is going to give you for being a Christian. Some of you are tempted to make money at the expense of following God's call on your life. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with making money. Just like there's nothing wrong with having influence. And there's nothing wrong with being well-known. Nothing wrong with any of this stuff. But some of you are tempted to go with worldly ambition and what money can buy and you know full well God is calling you to something else. And yet you're resisting it because you want to go after the money. And then there are some of you that (laughs) you just kind of resign yourself to being poor. But you uh, you kind of want to make your life over in the things that money can buy. You want to forge your identity according to the things that the world is trying to sell you. This consumer mentality of my life is tied up in the kind of cars that I drive and the kind of people I hang around with and the kind of of clothes that I wear. And so even though you're never going to make a lot of money, you really value those sorts of things that this consumer culture is trying to force on you. And there's some of you, you're not altogether tempted by these things, but you just, you got a comfort zone, buddy. You got a rut. You have a place that you're pretty comfortable. I talked to my brother last night at the golf tournament dinner. And he talked about his own conversion and how that he was just, he, he was pretty comfortable. Yeah. And yet he's sitting there at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And, and something begins to gnaw at his heart. I am not satisfied. There's got to be something more. Let me tell you, there is something more. And the Holy Spirit is calling out to every one of us, there's something more. There's something that can satisfy. And it's the only thing that can satisfy. You see, God is calling you. The Spirit is begging you to be decisive. To make a decisive choice while it is called today at this crucial moment in your life. He's calling you to be decisive about what you need to leave behind. The world with all its ambitions and status and consumer identity and materialism and thirst for power, God wants you to leave that behind and follow Him with abandon. He's calling you out of your comfort zone. And y'all, when you're called out of your comfort zone, it's scary and it's strange. It's strange because you're being called into a new territory that you've never been in before. But God's calling you there. And He's going to lead you. If you will follow Him in faith, He's going to lead you with His own hand. And let me tell you, He's calling you to places right here in Tampa, Florida, where Jesus says you're going to be maligned and ridiculed by the world. And and maybe some of you are going to be maligned and ridiculed by some of the people closest to you. There are some of you in this room right now that are struggling with whether or not to become Christians and you are struggling with that because some of the people closest to you in your friendship network and among your family are going to distance themselves from you if you become a Christian. But he's calling you. The same Christ that called Moses, He's calling you. Don't make any mistake about it. God is calling you to this radical decision. He's begging you to be, to, to be decisive to embrace this faith that Moses had. But in our increasingly post-Christian world, I believe that being faithful is going to involve something else that Moses did. And that's my third point. 
forsake the world for the sake of the world. Now you hear what I said? Forsake the world for the sake of the world. We think that the only way we're going to win the world is to be like the world. That's precisely the opposite of the Bible's recipe. The Bible, everywhere on its pages, says forsake the world for the sake of the world. This text sees Moses as making a decisive choice to break free from bondage to the world. That's what Egypt is a symbol of in the Bible. The world. You see, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He acted decisively to refuse to be a part of that. Verse 27 says he forsook Egypt. And that word forsook there is just as strong of a verb as the word refuse in verse 24. It means to completely abandon something, to deny it, to turn your back on it forever. He forsook the world. He forsook Egypt. He made a decisive break with his former life as an an Egyptian prince. And this is what God's calling you to do. It's not easy to hear. It's not something that we in our lukewarm Christian culture are used to hearing. Nonconformity to the world. Separation from the world. Forsaking the world. These are things that if you are a Bible reader, you are very much at home with. And yet somehow in the modern Christian world, this is something we've not been used to hearing. But we see it all throughout the Bible. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If a man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I could go on and on and on. But even though Egypt is a symbol of the world, and even though Moses is praised by the authors of the New Testament for separating from the world, this does not imply that we can remove ourselves away from faithful activity in the world. Now this is the great balance being in the world, but not of the world. And I think, you know, y'all watch TV just like I do. And you see what's going on in our world and the way that our culture is moving. And it is not in a positive direction. And yet let me tell you, we cannot remove ourselves from the world. We have to forsake the world and our values, attitudes, and priorities, but it is for the sake of the world. We must remain in the world. Jesus says, I have left them in the world. We have whole books of the Bible like Esther and Daniel that talk about the differences that God's people can make in pagan societies and cultures, in totally secular pursuits. Most of y'all are going to be involved in secular pursuits. I think of people like my good friend Dr. Brett Frazier who is involved in a secular pursuit in a very key area. I mean, you just look at Joseph. I mean, just a few verses before... He talked about Joseph. But Joseph's whole life was in secular government, right? And yet just a few verses before, the author of Hebrews brags on Joseph for being faithful. So being faithful will involve being in the world. But if you're not separate from the world and forsaking the world in your values, attitudes, and priorities, you will not be able to affect the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But how did Moses forsake the world? Oh, this brings me to our fourth and final point this morning. He embraced the reproach of Christ. See, forsake the world, that's kind of a negative thing. But the way that he did that was he embraced something. He embraced the reproach of Jesus Christ. It says that right in that text. Now, embracing the reproach of Christ... What does it say there? He esteemed the reproach. Let's see. The repro- esteeming the reproach of Christ, verse 26, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. You see, for Moses to forsake the world, he had to, to, to embrace the reproach of Christ. That, that's really like talking about repentance and faith. My old theology professor, Leroy Fourline, said that repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. To have faith, you must repent. Repentance, a 180 degree turn. But you're turning away from something and toward something. So you cannot forsake the world just because you make up your mind to do so. 
You forsake the world because you are reaching toward a positive end. You are embracing the reproach of Christ. But just think about that phrase, embracing the reproach of Christ. That's odd. My, my son, Matthew, when he was a younger boy, he would say awkward. He, he meant to say odd, but he would say, well, that's awkward. <laughs> well, let me tell you, that is awkward. That is odd to say that we need to embrace the reproach of Christ. You see, to go against our culture, to go against the grain, and to embrace the reproach of Christ is going to be the hardest thing we do. But that's exactly what God is calling on us to do. To embrace the reproach of His dear Son. And when we embrace the, the Christ life, when we follow Jesus with our whole heart, we are going to be maligned. We are going to be reproached by this world. That's one thing Jesus promises us. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. The world will hate you if you follow Jesus. That's why severe persecution is taking place all over the world. There's more martyrdom today than in the entire history of the church combined. But this is all to be expected. That we're going to have more reproach, more persecution in a world that is setting its face against Christ more and more. And you will experience persecution at work, at school, in college, even in your own family and among some of your closest friends if you decide to embrace the reproach of Christ, you will be hated by the world. But don't worry about it. The Apostle John says, do not worry. In fact, he says, don't be surprised if the world hates you. That's almost a direct quote from, the, from John's first uh, epistle. Do not be surprised if the world hates you. You see, this is all to be expected. It's all over the Bible. When you read the Bible, you come to expect that believers in Christ are going to suffer the reproach of the world even to the point of martyrdom. We don't think a whole lot about martyrdom. We don't live in China. We don't go to a house church. We're not under, placed under arrest for our faith. So we don't think a lot about martyrdom. But I believe that we need to re-embrace a faith of martyrdom, a martyrdom kind of faith. And I believe that things are going to get more difficult for the church of Jesus Christ. I really do. In this increasingly post-Christian age, I don't know how long it's going to take. I have no doubt that in the very near future, schools like ours and churches like this will lose their tax-exempt status. Well, of course, the people in China would laugh and say, well, <laughs> that's nothing. That's nothing. The people in the Middle East who are being persecuted and killed for their faith, they would say, tax exempt what? That's nothing. And yet those are the sorts of subtle persecutions I believe we will continue to face as believing Christians in society. But don't worry. Because as Tertullian, the great church father said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. <laughs> what that means is you're suffering. For the gospel, your embrace of the reproach of Christ is just a seed. More people are going to come to Christ the more you embrace that suffering. And Moses knew this. He knew that unless he was willing to suffer and die with the people of God out in the wilderness, he would never be able to please God and do what God has called him to do. But y'all, this idea of the re embracing the reproach of Christ, it's a foreign idea to us. It's a foreign idea in many of our churches because it goes against the grain. It's not comfortable. It's not exciting. It's not going to draw people in by the droves. And maybe it's why not more people are answering the call to difficult mission fields because we are not talking enough in our churches about embracing the reproach of Christ. The consumer Christianity that so many Christians have embraced today is inconsistent with an embrace of the reproach of Christ. The more comfortable you are, 
the less willing you will be, uh, be to embrace the approach of Christ. And we even see it in people that are writing books about how to grow the church. People who I think their hearts are right. They really want to see more people come to Christ. But people are writing books that are telling us the only thing you've got to do to draw people into the church and to grow the church is to make people comfortable and happy and to attract people to your church based on stuff they like. In other words, you give them entertainment that they enjoy, kind of like what they listen to on the radio and what they love out in the world. And non-Christian people will flock to your church and they will be converted and they will become Christians because you're providing them something like the world provides them that they enjoy and they like. You're attracting them. You're appealing to them based on their consumer tastes and preferences. (laughs) Somehow we feel as if we can sell the gospel and peddle the church. And we think that if we can do the things that secular organizations do to bring people into the church, to to draw a crowd, well, then we'll really have it. We've helped the Lord out a little bit with some of our methods that we're using. It's almost as though sometimes we feel that the gospel and the spirit don't have their own intrinsic power to get the job done. They need our help. They need Matt Pinson's personality. They need a certain style of music. They need a certain entertainment mentality. They need a good joke teller in the pulpit. A good, there's one famous preacher in our day that said, if, if young preachers really want to draw in people to the gospel, they will watch Chris Rock videos and learn how to be funny like Chris Rock is. So it's almost like, you know, the gospel and the spirit and the things that the Lord has used throughout the great missions movements of the, of, of, of the ages, throughout the great uh, awakenings and the great times of harvest in the history of the church, those things that God has used, the ordinary means of grace we see in the Bible, mm, that's not really going get, to get the job done. We've got to add. We've got to help. We've got to do something to attract customers. And what this means is that churches are trying to attract people based on things that have nothing to do with the Spirit or the church or the Bible or the gospel. They're basing it all on what the world is doing. But you know, this is exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches. You see, the picture of the church we have in the Bible is of the scandal of the cross. That's what the Bible teaches about the Lord. It's a scandal. The Bible presents a gospel that is not attractive to the natural man, that is not appealing to the natural man. It's a gospel that must penetrate men's and women's hearts and minds by means of the Word of God and by means of the Spirit of God, not by means that are appealing and attractive to the natural man. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. You see, in the Bible, we're presented with a gospel that is scandalous. It's referred to as a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. It's not something that gives you a warm fuzzy. It's not something that gives you your best life now. It's not something that makes everybody think you're cool. Instead, it causes people to be angry That's what we see in Jesus' ministry. People become angry and they become riled up when they hear the gospel. The Bible says that the gospel is either going to attract people because it's a sweet-smelling savor or it's going to push people away. The gospel creates tension in people. That's what it's meant to do. It causes people to be angry. And that's why Jesus said the world will hate the church. The gospel is a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. That's what it is by its very nature. And that's why the church, to be the church, must embrace the reproach of Christ. To turn their backs on the world and go after Christ. Now don't get me wrong. (laughs) Some people take this as to mean, well, if you be as mean as you can be, then you're a better Christian. No. You know the people that you really see God working through. The preachers that have a humble and a meek and loving spirit. They're not puffed up with pride. 
They, they love people. They're compassionate to people. You see, that's what the world needs. That's how the world will be attracted to the gospel is through, lead, is through deeds of love and mercy. When people see that we're compassionate, that we really care about them, that we're willing to hold their hands and cry with them, that we're willing to get into the details of their lives and stay with them and love them and help them and serve them. And we really mean it. We really love them. That's what does the job. But as much of that as we have, if we present the gospel of the Bible, it will meet with hostility. But John says, don't worry. Don't be surprised. Jesus said, don't worry. The world hated me, hated me before it hated you. And when you embrace the reproach of Christ, you will be looking for that reward that you will have where there will be no hostility, no anger, no tension, only peace, love, and joy forevermore. And the Lord Himself will take you to Himself. And you will be His forever and ever and ever. So don't worry. Don't get so worried and focused about the present moment that you take your eyes off of what God has for you and that you cannot see the invisible God. So in closing, I exhort you, brothers and sisters, do something that's going to be very hard. Do something decisive. Be like Moses who by faith esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Forsake the world for the sake of the world. Embrace the reproach of Christ. Embrace the faith of Moses. And if you do, you will change your world forever. Let's bow in prayer. Our God, we pray that you would change us through your word. That this passage would take root in our hearts and in our minds. And it would sprout forth into all kinds of good works that will change this world. That will motivate us to embrace the reproach of Christ. To imitate the faith of Moses. To be decisive in our spiritual commitments and to give our all to you, our all in all. Lord, change us today. Motivate us today by your word and your spirit. Through your son's name we pray. Amen. Stand together if you need to pray. The altars are open as we say. Page 185. Softly and tenderly.
give Dr. Benson a hand this morning. Appreciate the message. We have the ushers in the back. Uh, as we're leaving, we'll be taking an offering up for him in the Bible College. So everything you give uh, this evening or this uh, at the end of service will be going.